that there were once creatures both small and gigantic that, that were living on the earth that were destroyed in different cataclysms and that a lot of the, the rocks that we're taught are formed through compression of sea life and land life that, that's pressed down for millions and millions of years under the seafloor. Um, you know, that, that that's not necessarily accurate and that, that many of the rocks that we're actually seeing are, are literally hardened remains of, of different creatures. Uh, you know, the tissues are, are all around us, but we're not, our eyes are not trained to see them. Welcome to Business Game Changers. I'm Sarah Westall. I have Mike Wilkerson coming to the show and he is working on this field co called biogeology. He, that's the term he came up with. And I, this has to be one of the more fascinating things I have seen in a while. And he has so much evidence for it. I don't know what to even think about it at this point, but because it's out there, but it's hard not to be absolutely fascinated and want to know more because everything he's showing me on and showing us in this interview tells me that maybe he's on to something. And I saw some of his clips, he was on the SGT report, and then I started watching some of his stuff and I thought, this is absolutely fascinating. I want to learn more. And he's seeing these rocks that look like hearts and mountains that look like elephants. And he's showing us how it's anatomically correct in all these ways, you know, 50 different ways that it matches up to biology and why. And he's coming in. And when he gets pushback and I'm telling him this, I want you to get even more pushback. And so that you can try to answer all these questions. You can't, it's very difficult to be proven wrong unless people really challenge you. But so far, no one's been able to challenge him in ways that he hasn't been able to come up with an answer. And so people are more and more intrigued. He's getting huge followings because of that. And it's just absolutely fascinating. If you're listening to this on podcast, then I recommend you come to my uh, website and look at this in video if you have time so you can see some of these images. It's just absolutely fascinating. Otherwise, I think you should be able to follow along mostly in um, podcasts and audio. So if you want to look at the video or if you want to look at the video and see the uh, pictures, go to sarahwestall.com and you'll see it on my website. You can search by his name or it'll be on the front page for a while. I also wanted to tell you that uh, for my patrons, we know that the C60 is the best way to deal with your immunities from an overall perspective and my patrons get 10% off on that. There are coupons for C60 for regular listeners as well on my shop. Just it's so important for us to really be focusing on our immunities right now. So let's get into this really great show with Mike Wilkerson. Mike, thank you so much for joining the program. Pleasure to be here, thank you. You have the most crazy <laughs> and interesting thing I've seen in a while. And with all the hard shows I do, I thought, gosh, I wanna do this because I, I, I love getting on the box. I like looking at things that are completely different and we've been kind of bogged down with really serious issues. And I, I not that this isn't, it's not as serious, you know, it's, it's very interesting. It's about history, it's about, you call it bio, geology. Can you explain how you got into this, where you learned that this was even a thing? Yeah, it started a couple of years ago. Um, I was watching all sorts of different videos on, on different unusual topics. And one of the, the topics that I came across was something called mud fossils. And that's basically uh, the idea that certain aspects of what we've been taught about geology, some pretty major ones, uh, are, are not actually accurate. And that the amount of time that it takes for something to fossilize, for example, is uh, we're, we're told that it happens in, in the space of you know millions of years of time, when in reality, under certain conditions, it can happen very, very rapidly. Mm -hmm. And so that's one aspect of it. And then the other aspect of it is that that there were once creatures both small and gigantic that, that were living on the earth that were destroyed in different cataclysms and that a lot of the, the rocks that we're taught are formed through compression of sea life and land life that, that's pressed down for millions and millions of years under the seafloor. Um, 
you know, that that that's not necessarily accurate, and that that many of the rocks that we're actually seeing are are literally hardened remains of of different creatures. Uh, you know, the tissues are are all around us, but we're not our eyes are not trained to see them. Well, and how many of these rocks would you say? I mean, are they, I mean, you say they're everywhere. Are you know, half the rocks we're looking at is really human or it, biological. It really, it really depends on where you are. I happen to live in a, in a place in Spain where there's a lot of traces of, of cataclysm, mud flood and volcanic. Um, and the research that I started on initially had to do with the, the idea of titans, which is, it sounds utterly crazy. These talking like beyond giants. We're talking about creatures that are the size of mountains. And um, it was a variety of different topics that that got me considering the possibility that a mountain here in the area that I live in, in Spain, could actually have been one of these ancient creatures. I, um, I started with with the idea of mud floods. Mud floods are, are are something that a lot of people, a lot of independent researchers are looking at that are that are the, the undeniable traces and remnants of worldwide cataclysms that that literally wiped out, you know, life as we we know it, uh, possibly multiple times. And the, the traces of that are are found in cities all around the world. There's another topic that a lot of people are diving into about Tartaria, which is uh, an ancient empire that we learn nothing about in schools that that um, happens to be the largest empire that that ever existed. So there are all these different topics that I was I was looking into at the same time. And then I saw a video on the subject of Titans and I I never thought anything of it because it seems like a, a silly topic. Um, but when I was when I uh, was watching this one video in particular, showed some pictures of an island in Maui, uh, another another place in Iceland, and these are places that look very much like elephants. And and the mountain that do that you have is those pictures behind the town? Yeah, I do. That way, when so, you're talking about them, we can look at them. Okay, so this is this is one of the the images that really got me uh, thinking because this this particular uh, rock looks a heck of a lot like an elephant turning to the side. And a lot of people might be thinking this is totally crazy. This is this is what's known as pareidolia, where you're looking up at, at a cloud or you're looking at uh, anything and you see a particular pattern and you you uh, assume that, that what you're seeing is actually real. So this is the mountain in, in Javier, Spain, which is where I, I live. And it's known affectionately as the elephant by locals for for obvious reasons. When you get from afar, it looks a lot like an elephant that's lying on its on its stomach. And I've always been fond of it, but it never occurred to me that it might actually actually actually, actually be a titan, which sounds totally absurd. But um, I, I work as a chiropractor and I've studied a lot of anatomy and I had been up to this eye on numerous occasions. And so after seeing these videos, I started to, to wonder, is there any, or is it, is there any truth at all to this? And I'd already been watching these videos on mud fossils and, and observing the rocks around me and pondering how could these, these rocks have possibly formed the way they did because they, they, they did look very biological. In, in nature. So I started to get online and, and on uh, Google Earth and, and start to tour around the island. I can do that or the, around, the, around the mountain. So this is, this is the mountain. And uh, you can see here. So since I did the videos, I've done a five part series called Unveiling a Titan. You can see um, this is the the thumbnail for the first of the videos, the the uh, the tusk had yeah. to be photoshopped, obviously. <laughs> yeah. But uh, since I did that, the 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 mountain has actually been edited on Google Earth. This is how it used to look, and you can see the the eye clearly, and I could soar all around. But now on Google Earth, um, the sections of the mountain that I reported and I reported on in the second and the third video 
have been um, have been edited out, which is uh, a fascinating thing. But if you get in really close, they they open up. But now you can't now you can't get a, further away and see the bigger picture. But initially, what I was doing is I was looking around because I, it you know pareidolia is where you see a mountain and it looks like a face and the shadows are hitting it just right. And and so you know to to make the assumption that that's a real creature would be you know a delusion. Yeah. Would well, you have a picture of it uh, before Google wiped it off? Uh, let's see here. That's the other. That's the backside. Um, uh, you mean a picture of uh, the Google Earth section? Like yeah. This is, do you this have is, it before Google yeah, took it off? That's taken with Google Earth there, and and you 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 know the eye is here, and this section, <laughs> this section is actually in here. Um, so. Let's see. So it's basically, hard for me to see that. You know, I look at it and go, oh, I don't I don't know if I see it. But you you really analyze it. You can see it better, I suppose. Yeah. So so basically, if you look at it from this angle, there are cutouts here on both sides where where the head becomes the shoulder. And there's also if you from from further down there's a plateau right here where the the trunk would be so you've got the the head shape you've got the back and then you have the the eye right where uh, right where the eye should be so as i started to fly around this this uh this mountain as i'm as i'm doing now with you and before there was a lot more detail i remembered that i'd been up this canyon which is exactly right where the uh, where the legs would be and and there's the remnants of, of a rib cage. You can see the, the lines coming down. Some of the people are thinking, I'm this guy's out of his mind crazy. But as I started to look at this more, I had been at the the eye on numerous occasions, and it's a very unusual cave. And there are all kinds of channels going back in different in different ways. And there's this little section here. And so rather than just give in to, uh, to Paradoli and, and assume that, oh, this is, a, this is an elephant, I decided to go back to the anatomy books and I started looking at, at, uh, at elephant anatomy and comparing um, the things that, that are in the fossil record. This is, this is the, the remains of, of an elephant. This is turned to limestone. The mountain itself is made out of limestone. Um, which we're told from mainstream geology is composed mainly of skeletal fragments, marine organisms, corals, forms, and mollusks. So what we know of, of limestone is that it's actually made of bone. So that's, uh, that's kind of how I, I started to, to get on the topic. And as I, as I went, went into it more and was studying the anatomy, I decided that the, the only way to proceed would be to have a laundry list of different um, kinds of things that I'd be expecting to find as I went back to the eye. So I got online and I was studying the the anatomy in 3D, and um, there are all kinds of different um, bones structures that that you know when you look at the eye socket of a of a um, of a vertebrate, not just an elephant, but uh, any of the vertebrates, then what you have are are places where the bones meet and they're called sutures and so for example if you look here I, I can show you on an elephant I'm not trying to be disingenuous by showing you with a human um, but the, you know for example this is a fissure for the optic nerve there's a section here where where it goes down into what would be the the nasal cavities the the eye is here and so I started to look at these these different you can see the mouse when I'm moving it right these different uh, these different lines there in in the cave, cave there are there are sloping channels that go down exactly here and um, it's exactly and, the shape of that so you're I mean it's just thing yeah. after thing after thing is consistent with what exactly. the remains would look like. yeah so so I had a list before I went up to the up to the eye of of different anatomical features and when I got there. I found 10 of the things that were on my list. I found the optic fissure, I found sutures, 
the overall shape, the position. This was a big one here. If you look, if you look at this, this is this is called the infraorbital foramen. All vertebrates have it. It's where there are nerves and blood vessels that come through here, and and that is actually um, where did that go? If we look, there's so much material. It's sometimes hard to keep it all straight, but. Uh, that's what you're looking through right there. So this is this is what I'm talking about. This this here is the eye socket of of an elephant. And see this line here? That's the suture between those two bones I was showing before. And this line here is in the exact same location. It even does a little jog right there, just like this one does. So it started to get it started to get pretty weird when I got up there because because I was finding so many things. Here's the optic fissure in an elephant's skull, and that's in the exact same location in the in the cave. It's not just this one cave though. You started finding these anomalies all over the place, right? Like there's heart. I saw heart pictures of rocks that look like. Do you yeah, have any that, of those pictures? That, that came later because what what happened was um, I. Um, I started looking at all the rocks differently after this because I went up to the eye, then I started to hypothesize that there might be an ear. Uh, and when I started looking into that, that's when it got really strange because not only did I not know there was a cave there, but I went looking for the cave, uh, just hypothesizing that it was there. And I found out that there is a cave there and without having known anything about it, it turned out to be the, the most thoroughly excavated cave in, in all of Europe. Uh, which was very <laughs> unexpected. They had a whole team of archaeologists that went up there. They did 3D mapping of the internal parts of the cave. They found the remains of, of uh, humans. There were cave paintings. And then I started to, to analyze the, the anatomy of the inner ear and compare that with all of this amazing footage that they had gotten. And that, that really um, caused me to start looking at, at everything differently. So um, I did a video... The, the One of the things that was frustrating to me about the whole concept of mud fossils is that there are tons and tons of videos out there of people uh, holding up different rocks and making you know outland outlandish claims about what those rocks are. And you know sometimes they look like what the person is claiming, and other times it just looks like a rock. So I figured if there there's any chance that there's any truth to this and that, that soft tissue can actually petrify, not just fossils, because when we think of fossils, we're talking most of the time about skeletons. And according to mainstream geology, it's very, very rare that that a that soft tissue will petrify, because normally it's it's uh, decomposed by worms and larvae and, and microbes long before it could ever turn to stone. Uh, but there are a number of conditions in which things can turn to stone. So I was walking in a river bottom and I came across this rock and, and it was utterly mind blowing because I recognized it immediately as a heart. And having studied anatomy, I, I immediately spotted between six and eight different specific anatomical features. I brought the rock home. I started to pull out my anatomy books and look at a lot of the different structures that were in the, in the hearts and the anatomy books. And before long, I had this list that, that you see on the, on the right. And I even purchased an endoscopic camera so I could get inside and look at the chambers. But uh, without going into the specifics of the anatomy, th this rock now, I've, I've, um, the list is up to 20 different specific anatomical features. So to me, at some point, you, ha you have to start questioning how many coincidences does it take before there starts to be a recognizable pattern. And that was what was happening with the mountain, and that caused me to look at all the stones differently. differently. And then, then I, I figured, okay, well, this should be repeatable, because that's the whole idea behind the scientific method, is you have some kind of an idea, you, you, you're looking at, at the physical world around you, empirical evidence, and you're trying to make sense of patterns. And if, you know, if there's a recognizable pattern, then you have to set up some kind of a test to see if it's repeatable. So I went out into the into the river bottoms and I was filming and um, in the space of about 15 minutes I found a whole bunch of different rocks that had these same anatomical features and you can see there's very specific places where there are openings they have a particular shape and 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 this reoccurs across different sizes 
so it's it it's it was a fascinating thing to um isn't there some more thing too about about the blood and the iron i was saying right you were go ahead Mm. well that i was finding with both the the mountain and the um and the rocks themselves because um if we go into let's see here so if we look at if we look at bone, for example, this is this is the inside of a femur, and you've got the the hard bone on the outside, and then on the inside you have what's known as trabecular bone. In the in the head, it's called spongous bone, and this is where the blood is produced in 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 the body. It's produced in our skull and in our long bones, and blood is is rich in iron because it contains you know it's it's got hemoglobin and hemoglobin is is rich in iron. So so as I was walking around the plateau that was at, at, in front of, of Mont Go, uh, I was finding all kinds of very unusual rocks that I was having a hard time explaining um, based on what I knew about geology. You know, the, these channels are going through these rocks and, and they're filled with this reddish earth, but not just the reddish earth, they're, they're actually caked with iron ore. So this I'm hypothesizing is is actually the the the, the blood <laughs> of what what would be trabecular bone. This is what trabecular bone looks like under a microscope, and it's fractal in nature. So it, it goes from bigger to smaller and smaller, and, and it looks like Swiss cheese. And if you look at if you look at bone, this is skull bone, and it's it's looks like a sandwich. You have the top, and then you have this blood rich area here, and then you have the bottom. And then the trabecular bone. This is how bone grows. It grows like trees. So I was finding a lot of different rocks that that had these channels and had the iron ore stuck to them. And then and then I was seeing sections of the mountain where portions of the mountain were broken away, and then it was reddish underneath. And so I believe that that's that's this this outer section of the of the sandwich, so to speak, that's gone, and it's exposing the the blood rich section inside does it have the porous like the bones do does it have the yeah and in fact when you get uh when you get up close to some of these rocks they they look like uh you you can you can see micro blood vessels going through them this is this is an example on the top of the mountain of this spongious bone so if you think of that this has all been worn away by wind and rain but you can still see little traces of red here but compare that to to this or to this, it's exactly the same. So the 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 elements have, have eroded this part because. Can you zoom in uh, to be able to see that little the spongy? Sure. No, not on this, but on the real, on the on the yeah, rock. So yeah, so this is one where where the the earth has has uh, has gone out of it. Um, Let's see. I don't have any good samples. I wasn't planning on going into this much detail on this topic here. This is this is what I am I call cortical bone, and I've done five videos on this on this topic. Uh, on, on they're called unveiling a titan. First video is just an overview. Second video covers the eye. Third video goes in detail into the ear. The fourth video is looking at the histology, which is the, the technical term for the tissues. And I analyze all of the different rocks all over the mountain. And I show how that corresponds to what you would expect to find anatomically in that part of the mountain. And, and it lines up time after time after time. So this this is what would be known as cortical bone. So if you think of the outer sandwich that I talked about, this doesn't have much in the way of what's known as vascularity, which are the blood vessels. So that's going to be more like solid rock, and then the occasional little channel going through it. And that is it's, that is exactly what this is showing. You can see that there's a chunk of this rock that is broken off here, and then it's revealed right inside. This reddish earth, which is which is literally oozing out of this this channel, so this is cortical bone, and then you have the smaller blood vessels, but it doesn't look like the the trabecular bone that I'm that I showed in these other rocks. Here you can see you want to get up close. This is a good example. If you get up right up close to it, you can see that it has a very biological look and feel to it. And then you can see the iron ore that's caked in going right through where this this would this blood vessel 
would have been. This is so strange. And, um, okay. So can so you get, can you get I just, yourself back? I was back? just going to show you this yeah, real quick. Going. So this, this, this is a list of coincidences with the mountains. So people who are, are interested in this can pause it and they can start to read through this and get an idea of just how specific these are and just how many of them there are. And that is just the first half of them because just on the mountain alone, there are over 50 different specific coincidences. And the last one is the, the Google Earth censorship because after I reported on the mountain, this is how it used to look from a distance and how it looks how it looks now as soon as you get away from it it's all blurry and the only section of the mountain that's blurry is the section where the eye and the ear are and if you go to any of the other mountains in the region now people might be thinking it doesn't look very much like an elephant from this side and this portion of, of the mountain has all collapsed according to mainstream geology this curvature here is what's known as a synclinal, and that's when um, there's an actual major collapse of the of the uh, the mountain. I, I have an example of that somewhere, but I'm not going to go looking for it. You had a question a moment ago. Now, are you getting pushback? Are you getting anything that actually, with this kind of a tough subject, I would think you'd want some pushback so you can question yourself and you can keep validating what you're finding. I've gotten I've gotten some very good questions. I've uh, the people who have, there have been basically, when it comes to criticism, there have been three categories. There have been people who have just dismissed it with a hand wave and said, this is ridiculous, and they, they won't even give the idea the time of day. Uh, and then there have been other people who uh, lead with insults, and I, I don't even pay attention to them. And, and those, both, both of those categories have been a very, very small percentage. And then there have been other people that are like, yeah, but what about? And then they have these questions. And... And I have That's answers to a lot of those questions. And, and um, I, I had tons of questions myself. And it's only been now. The, the video that I'm working on that I'm hoping to finish in the next couple of days, I'm about to go on vacation, so I'm working frantically to finish it, um, is, is all about the different explanatory models for how these things could have come about. And um, initially, the only thing I had as an explanation was mud flood. But that didn't make any sense for the mountain. I, I want to explain a point I forgot to explain. The, the, the idea behind the mud fossils is that when they're buried in mud, there is, there's no air there. And so what happens is the microbes and the larvae that would normally eat away at the flesh and cause it to decompose, they can't thrive in that environment. And so then what happens is a slow exchange between the, the mud and the earth that's surrounding the tissue with the gases and the fluids that are in the tissue. And that exchange, we're told, happens over millions of years. Like we know that petrification, you know, can occur. This is, this is um, a pine cone that was covered by a volcanic flow in Argentina. Everybody knows about petrified wood. So we know that organic material can petrify. It's just that we're given timelines that stretch in the tens and millions of, tens to hundreds of millions of years. So we've never really gone around looking at things from the perspective of, wait a minute, could that have been something that, that petrified in recent times? Well, there's a lot of evidence for recent mud flood, and we can see it in our cities. And anyone, you know, I, I encourage anyone to go out there, do searches for mud flood, Tartaria, look into star forts. These are incredibly interesting topics that none of us hear anything about. What's a star fort? I've never, I don't know what a star fort is. Um, let's see. This is a star fort. Oh, wait, I'm not sharing. Hold no, on. you're not. And you might, uh, might want to show uh, us that uh, pine cone picture, too. <laughs> oh, yeah, thank you. I forgot I wasn't sharing. Okay. So this is, uh, this is a, the pine cone I was referring to. Great, great, great detail can be preserved in these, in these fossils. To do with mud, um, has to do with electricity. These are the kinds of things that I'll be covering in my next video. So, um, star forts. This is a, a total aside, but it's just something for people who are curious. They can start to look into. We're not taught about these at all. Uh, we're told well. We're told that they're bastion forts that were built in the 15 to 17, 1900s to protect against cannon fire. Um, and the more you look into them, the more you realize that they don't. They just don't, uh, 
make any sense as far as that narrative. But why? Same thing with Tartaria. Why about because the star? They're 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 far too grand and they're all over the world. My friends have mapped so far to date five thousand of these. They're on every continent, and um, mainstream history just doesn't cover them properly. <laughs> It's just a, it's a rabbit hole people can go down. Star Forts and then Tartari as well. If we um, do a search online, most people have never even heard of, of Tartaria. So if you, um, if you just look into maps, you'll see that, that Tartaria, we're told it was just a, a, a roving Mongol tribes, but it, it was an empire that stretched all across all of Asia, all of Siberia, into Europe, into North and South America. It was, it was a worldwide empire that, that uh, people are only just now starting to really wake up to. And if you go into the old history books, it's undeniable that Grand Tartaria was everywhere. And the star forts and the Tartarian architecture, what we call Greco-Roman architecture, um, are, are incredibly fascinating to look into. And there's a, probably a lot of historians out there that think I'm off my rocker, but well, it's just it, interesting. I now, just what encourage is, people to look into it. What do you think the star forts are for? I mean, when you hear star fort, you're thinking aliens yeah. or something. But some, really, some, some say they were for mining purposes. Uh, what we know about them is a lot of the old world cities. You know, when we look at, at Europe, thinking of Paris and, and Copenhagen and Stockholm and Amsterdam and Antwerp and all these, all these great cities all over Spain. Uh, these were all built on and around star forts. The star forts were actually there first, and this is provable because you can go back and you can look at the old maps of the cities that are, you know, from several hundred years ago in the old books and find find them. This picture, what that picture you had up, was all was built all around those star forts, or that is a star fort. That is a star fort, and a, a lot of the star forts have been covered in mud. So that gets back to the the mud flood topic. Um, and mud flood is, is just a, a, a potential explanation for, for how these things could have petrified, getting back to, to that. And then we have all kinds of uh, examples of, of buildings around the world that we're told were carved out of stone. But when you look, at, look into them in more detail, there's, there's a, it makes a lot more sense that, that this was actually volcanic ash, volcanic flow, and that buildings were melted and then they've, they've gone in. You can see here, this is, this is in recent times, this is in ancient times. So there's a whole lot that, that we don't know about, about our history. And um, that's for sure. And, and when it comes to geology, I'd say more than ever that that's, that that's the case. Okay, well, I, I think this is, this is really interesting. Where can people find more about your work? I, I would like, well, first of all, tell them where they can find more about your work. The channel name is, is Stellium 7, and uh, I'll just, yeah, sometimes people put a space between the Stellium and the 7, and then they find a whole bunch of info on astrology. So that is, uh, that is the channel name. And um, Excellent. Okay, so you have a science background. You're, an, you're a chiropractor. You have a lot of biology, so you, you're able to then compare it to all this stuff. I like the idea of you getting um, respectful pushback of people who are trying to think of alternative ways of what this could be so that you can completely flush it out. Uh, yeah. I think it's absolutely fascinating. And so um, it, when people push back, are you able to um, flush out more from this? I mean, because... Absolutely. I'm constantly learning from the questions that people are giving me. I, I'm not. I'm not trying to present myself as an expert. I'm not a geologist. I'm not a, a paleontologist, a anthropologist, <laughs> any of these. I, I have a degree in chiropractic. I've studied a lot of of anatomy and a lot of uh, physiology and histology. And so, you know, somebody else uh, who's an expert in one of these fields would probably accuse me of of um, the Dunning Kruger effect, basically saying that I know just enough about something to get myself into trouble. And I've attempted to the best of my ability to approach this using scientific method, not making assumptions, trying to get ideas and hypotheses before going out to look. With the rocks, the heart stones, um, I, I have, which, which I'll present in the next video, I have what I believe is a, is a pretty good explanation for how this, this could be happening. 
that's based on on lahars and and volcanic activity um, and you know people can watch the videos and decide for themselves whether whether any of it makes sense um, I've had a number of people with science backgrounds praise the work that I've done and and um, concur with with my findings so well and and yeah. it's pretty common that new ways of thinking about things come from people in different fields it's it happens right. all the time i mean in fact almost you know 95 percent of the time this needs to happen more and more because what we have is such a compartmentalization in in every field right now in politics and in government and in, in in academia where you get specialists who are experts in a particular topic what do they say they say an expert is someone who knows more and more about less and less until they know absolutely everything about nothing, you know? Yeah, <laughs> and there's some, yeah. And there's some truth to that because you become so snowed in with your area of expertise that you're unable to see the bigger picture. And you might not even know what the person sitting next to you is, is doing in, in, your, in your office or, you know, in, your, in the school if you're a professor or something. So um, what we need is more cross-disciplinary uh, activity. And I think that's why I've been able to start to recognize these patterns is that I, I had, uh, uh, I started with a degree, uh, I grew up in California and uh, I, I went to the University of Santa Barbara and I had a degree in the humanities. And uh, so that combined with the science, I don't know, maybe, maybe it just, it, it makes me more um, um, apt to, to pattern recognition, but that's absolutely excellent. Either that or I'm wrong about everything. I could be wrong about everything. But. <laughs> well, no, but you know, you can't learn and you can't figure out new things without taking different perspectives. And that's, that's all of what, my, what I'm trying to do with my show is that's why I bring on people like you who just see things from a completely different perspective because you're not going to get there. Sometimes people are wrong, but, but it's okay to be wrong as long as you're flushing something out that seems like it might make sense, right? I don't think you're wrong. I'm just saying... There's, that's how we grow as a human species is that we ask questions and we look th at things from different paradigms. And whether you're wrong or not, I applaud the effort because that's how we grow and that's how we learn. And then you, you're, you can't be wrong until somebody can show you why you're wrong and, and can pr come up with the same. That's why I asked you about your, your pushback. Are you coming up with, and if all these pushback, the questions came surprising i yeah. thought i would get a lot i thought i would get a lot more but it may be that it just hasn't come out into the mainstream enough and once it does then you know people start making debunk videos and and wow. you know call me a, a crackpot and and i i would say um you know these are exciting times because there there are a lot of of you know what do you say the sacred cows that are that are um that are starting to be questioned and we're, we're learning more and more all the time about the nature of our physical reality and and you know the <laughs> all kinds of different aspects Absolutely. of the physical world and yeah. and so uh one of the things that i've tried to encourage people to do is don't don't take my word for any of this stuff look at the information that i present go out and test things yourself see if you find thing you know because with the heart stones the the thing that's unusual about them is they're very very specific you know, it's easy to find a, a stone that's that's an oval shape or a, or a sphere or something like that. It's an entirely different thing to find something that has specific channels exactly where they should be, has a particular form. And so that's what I show in, in Mud Fossils, The Heart of the Matter 1 and 2. I show people how to recognize the anatomy. I'm showing it with 3D rendering. I'm going inside. I'm showing the chambers. And then in the, in the there's a, another video that I did that I showed earlier that was... Um, petrified organs, giant's hearts, because I'm finding them on, on larger and larger scales. Hold on, I'll show. This is the biggest one I brought home. Uh, Trying not to hurt myself, but this, this is the exact same shape. It's got the, the openings for the, oh, I'm not even showing my screen, am I? No, Sorry. you are. Oh, I was. Oh, okay. Yeah, I can see you. Oh yeah, I'm showing me now. Okay, so there's the, the, the artery openings. It's, also got the aorta exactly where it should be. So I've, I've shown this over and over again across all different sizes. And I teach people how to recognize them in petrified organs, giant's hearts, uh, and how to spot them. And, uh, and so they can go out and test this themselves. And I'm not saying that all 
rocks or organs by any means. Some rocks are volcanic. They come from volcanoes. You can see them forming. Some may be fragmented portions of titans that, that I mean, this, this mountain that I studied is, it's two and a half miles long, four kilometers, and it's uh, 2,500 feet high. <laughs> so yeah. it's not a small creature. So hmm. and, it's uh, just it's very not... strange. It's a different look. We're almost microscopic if those are the size of the animals. So interesting. Okay, so they can get to your um, channel, Stellium 7. Do you have a website or just a YouTube channel? Not yet. I don't have a website, just okay. a YouTube channel. I've got, uh, I put them on BitChute because after the uh, editing of Google, I'm paranoid. So the, the videos are up there. People are welcome to mirror them if they like. Um, and then um, I've, I, yeah, I'll, I'll be eventually doing a website and I've got um, a book planned, but I'm finishing another book right now that I, that I started a long time ago. So that, that comes first. Well, I'm sure so, you're <laughs> finding people have a lot of interest because it's a new out of the box thing and, it, and things are making sense. I mean, I, know, I would like to hear some more pushback, not for, you know, from others so that it can get flushed out even more. Um, but yeah. at this point, if every the, time someone's coming at you, there's, you look into it and you find the answers for it, that's cool. That means, okay, maybe you got something here. This is really cool. Yeah. Yeah. The problem uh, from the mainstream geology side is that these ideas, if there's truth to them, they completely, you know, t uh, they, they, they shake the, the foundations of, of what we know about geology, what we know about petrogenesis, which is the formation of rock. Um, so it can't be accepted. It's too, it's way too out there. So the only that that's why I've been trying to teach people how to how to see these things. And maybe I'm just teaching them my delusions, but I don't I don't think so. And they can decide for themselves. <laughs> they can decide for themselves. Know. And look at it's another it's a, another way of looking at things. Well, thank you so much. This is such an exciting, very interesting topic to look at and to and to at least ask questions. If it's not true, then why? Come, tell me why, you know, that's you have to right. start with with that and and if you keep coming back with answers of well it seems like i have an answer for all these things then you know there's something to it so thank That's, you that was that was the unexpected part when i first started looking at the mountain from from afar i just i didn't think anything of it but when i started finding all these very specific connections it was just like yeah well welcome to the world of being a crazy nut job <laughs> until you you're going to stay there until you convince yourself one way or the other whether you're right or wrong and then if you convince yourself that you're right which i mean everything you showed me so far makes me want to look into it more i haven't seen anything that is like well you know hey let's look into this more but mm -hmm. um you'll be in this world forever i think now <laughs> once you're there you can't unlearn so thank you so much yeah. for joining the program just... go ahead no i was just going to say things are more interesting than, than ever so Yes, they it's are. Fun. It's fun. It's, it's an interesting time of discovery. So I encourage everybody else to, to go looking. <laughs> well, thanks again for coming Thank to you. the show. My pleasure. Bye-bye. February 1985, an 18-year-old Kirkland, Washington man pled guilty to four counts of computer trespass. The defendant was accused of gaining illegal access to four large Seattle area firms. Would you state your name, please? My name is Mike Wilkerson. Hi, my name is Mike Wilkerson. It's hard for me to believe, but it's been 36 years since that video clip that you just saw of me was recorded. I'm a former computer hacker, and I'm also the author and protagonist of this new book entitled The Hacker Prince, a true story about digital mischief in the 80s. The writing and revision stages of the book are now completed, and I'm launching this Kickstarter campaign in the hopes that you will join in with other backers and assist me in 
bringing this most unique and exciting story to the world. Usually they have the way it's set up is you dial in on one line and it calls you back on another so that you can't. It's supposed to be the ultimate security. But what you do is you, you break into Cosmos and you find out all of the phone numbers that that company owns and you call until you find the two that are hooked up to data. And then you get the callback modem and you set up call forwarding on that line so it call forwards to your own number. That takes a lot of work. but. As you can see from the newspaper clippings, the journalists did their best to cover the events, but the most exciting parts of the story remained untold, until now. This is a story about my early life and how I got into hacking, but it's about so much more. It takes place in the early 80s, at a time when telecommunications and hacking were still in their infancy. I was going on all sorts of uh, ill-advised adventures, and meeting with some of the most famous and infamous hackers of the era. Haven't been cut. You have this, yeah, this invulnerable feeling. You just don't think you're gonna get cut. You ask any hacker out there that, that hasn't been cut yet if he thinks he's gonna get cut, and he'll tell you now. And, and if they tell you yes, it's because somebody close to them just recently got busted, and they have a feeling of being watched. Whether you're curious about the '80s hacking scene and some of its most infamous characters or if you care to indulge in a bit of nostalgia for the early days of computing, or if you just simply like to kick back with a light-hearted coming-of-age tale, then this book is for you. I hope this project is of interest to you and that you'll assist me by taking part in this campaign. Thank you for taking the time to listen and take care. Oh, and please be sure to check out the, the rewards levels. Mm-hmm. <laughs>